Okay, let's get started. Um, my name's, uh, welcome this everybody this week to our uh, Miami Gold Rain, tu Rain Tumor Symposium. Uh, to give a short introduction to uh, the symposium today. My name is Michael Ivan. I'm one of the research uh, and neurosurgeons here at the University of Miami, specializing in brain tumor and skull base. Uh, I'm joined by my co-directors, Dr. Komatar, who is a professor of neurosurgery and our program director of our residency program, also director of our brain tumor program, and Dr. Morcos, who's a co-chairman of our department, director of our cerebrovascular and skull base program, and Dr. Benjamin, who's assistant professor and director of our skull base lab. Uh, this is our, our, our 40th uh, presentation or 39th presentation, and we couldn't do all of these symposiums without the help of the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, the Department of Neurosurgery, and University of Miami, and, and these administrators have really been the ones throughout the entire journey here of making it happen. And, and I, again, each week uh, and each month that we goes by, uh, they do not deserve enough praise uh, for all the work they do behind the scenes. So thank you to them. Uh, again, anybody who has any questions or, or comments about tonight's se seminar can always find us on the web or on social media. Uh, if you have any questions about future symposiums or about our department here at University of Miami, uh, here are the uh, websites and social media sites. Uh, just to remind you, we have multiple symposiums that happen every month. Uh, each one is, is monthly. Uh, we have the pediatric symposium that's happening August 9th. The next one is going to be talking about global surgery with a fantastic field uh, of uh, healthcare policy and advocates around the country, Dr. Park, Dr. Johnson, and Dr. Green. Uh, I think they, they are all extremely well known. And then Dr. Morcos has a uh, cerebrovascular skull base symposium this, this week or this month. It's going to be focused on advanced techniques for ABM and aneurysms um, on August 4th. For, uh, August 19th, uh, which is a Wednesday from five to seven with also a fantastic panel. So be sure to, to tune into them as well. Also a sneak peek next month uh, in September. First, we will welcome Dr. Liu from Rutgers, a uh, cerebrovascular uh, skull base specialist uh, who'll be talking to us about uh, specifically about tumors and cancer of the temporal bone and approaches to that. So join us next uh, month on September 1st. Uh, some housekeeping before we start, uh, please make sure uh, to ask questions. We want to make this as interactive as we can, especially with tonight's uh, guest. Uh, we don't offer CME, but you will get a, an email confirming your participation. And please be sure to like, follow, and share our videos. They're all recorded and posted on YouTube, so you could follow them. And we've had over 100,000 people watch our, our videos to date, so please make sure you watch all the prior ones as well. So this week, uh, to start off with the panelists who will be asking questions, we have a, a great group here, all from University of Miami, Dominique Higgins, uh, one of our uh, fellows who joined us from Columbia uh, as a brain tumor specialist, Dr. Patel joining us from Rutgers, also one of our surgical neuro-oncology fellows, uh, Dr. Cater is an infolded resident, who is also a, a fellow this week, th this year, and Dr. Morell, who's an Argentinian neurosurgeon who uh, has a passion for brain tumor and brain tumor research who has uh, joined us here as our clinical research coordinator and directing all of our clinical research uh, for our department. Uh, so thank you to the panelists. Uh, this month, uh, we have an extra special guest, Dr. Sinai. Uh, I've known him for a very, very long time. He's an inspiration and mentor to many residents and junior faculty across the country, and especially including me, since he was a chief uh, when I was an intern back at UCSF. And so he's been kind of a role model for me to watch for many, many years uh, and try to fill his footsteps, which is very, very difficult. He's been extremely successful. He did his uh, undergrad at UCSD, MD at UCSF, residency at UCSF, did a, a fellowship in, in neural stem cell biology, and then continued and did a fellowship at the Barrel before joining there and, and going up the ranks to just make a, a, just a phenomenal brain tumor center, where he's now the chi chief scientific officer and director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center. He's a professor of neurosurgery and the chair at neurosurgical oncology at the Barrow. Um, he's been uh, kind of one of the triple threats, uh, somebody who's been successful clinically in research and also just in, in mentors. Uh, specifically, uh, I think everything that he does in the research world is, is so well thought out and ends up having such a high impact in uh, all fields, not only neurosurgery, but in, in uh, stem cell biology and neurobiology and, and uh, his citations and, and the impact that he's had is just is, is very easily found with all of his papers. I won't go through all of the nature and cell and, and cell biology papers. He has a, a PI of, of one of the most uh, inspirational kind of um, 
clinical trials that he's, I'm sure he's going to talk about today. So I'm not going to talk too much about that in the intro, but he also has an NIH funded lab that's been ongoing now for since his time joining the barrel, which is an achievement in and of itself. So I know he's extremely busy. It's the middle of his day. And, and I want to thank him so much for taking the time out to talk to us uh, about his ideas of, of running surgical trials for brain tumors. Well, thanks, Michael. I appreciate the generous introduction and, and thanks to everybody who helped make this seminar series happen. Hopefully you can see my slides okay. Um, yeah, it looks good. What I'm gonna try to discuss over the next 40 minutes or so is sort of the role of the neurosurgeon in the setting of investigation. And I think for a lot of this audience, um, this will come as no surprise. We're all familiar with, with some of the traditions in our field as well as where it's going. But hopefully for the younger generations, this will give you some frame of reference, as well as give you a preview into, you know, where things are headed um, in this community. Um, you know, neurosurgeons, for as long as a specialty has existed, have kind of existed alongside investigation, inquiry, scientific interrogation. And the reason for that is quite simple. We operate on and treat patients for things going on in the least understood organ system in the body. And there are many, many examples of this and pretty much any early generation neurosurgeon embodied this spirit. Wilder Penfield is, is a commonly cited example, an epilepsy surgeon, as well as a brain tumor surgeon who um, really stood on the shoulder of other giants that he had trained with, Sir William Osler, Harvey Cushing, Odford Forster, et cetera, to sort of amalgamate the, the techniques that we currently today think of as, as awake mapping and intraoperative stimulation mapping. And so in his time, which was, you know, basically a half a century ago, he was performing uh, procedures that had never been done before and answering questions that had never been answered. Here, there's a picture of him in 1958 in Montreal. And like any great neurosurgeon, he then passed on uh, what he learned to the next generation who continued to ask more questions, um, including in that next generation were Edwin Boldry, who was one of the first faculty members at UCSF with Dr. Wilson, Arthur Ward, who founded the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Washington in Seattle, and then whom himself conveyed a lot of that along with Dr. Boldry to Dr. Ogerman, who, as we all know, is one of the fathers of stimulation mapping in the modern era. And the consequence of all of these efforts, and especially Dr. Penfield's, were knowledges that today we take for granted. Um, how else would we know how the human homunculus works than if a neurosurgeon didn't start to very meticulously stimulate regions of the dominant cortex and non-dominant cortex in patients like Dr. Penfield did. So a lot of the foundational information that we, we use today and basically assume has always been around were really the products of neurosurgical investigators. And initially, these were individuals who rose above others and really dedicated themselves to the clinical craft alongside the scientific craft. But over time, as departments started to proliferate, these individuals became more organized efforts in investigation. And any department today, whether it's University of Miami, Barron Neurological Institute, or these two coastal departments that I, I've listed for you here, UCSF and MGH, really embody this kind of strategy the realization that neurosurgery and neuroscience really have to be hand in hand because there are as many questions answered in neurosurgery as unanswered, and the same is true in neuroscience, and that scientists and surgeons need to be sort of ensconced together in these di divisions or departments. And there are many ways to kind of track this evolution, uh, but one common way is through federal funding. And federal funding trends tell us that neurosurgery departments have increasingly really proliferated their research efforts through the efforts of having neuroscientists within those programs and having those neuroscientists partner with neurosurgeons. And so you see here the trends in NIH funding by surgical departments that's been broken down 
by the department as a whole, and then the scientists within the department, and then the neurosurgeon scientists. So as departments started to generate themselves as hybrids of clinicians and scientists, the clinician scientist model itself started to rise as well. And that's something many of us are familiar with. And Ivan, I'm um, sorry, Michael, you know, alluded to that with my career and others. But for those of us who are neurosurgeon, neuroscientists, we know that this didn't happen by accident. These weren't decisions we made in a vacuum. They were encouraged by the infrastructure of organized neurosurgery that enabled us to do that. And one common example would be the NREF granting mechanism, which most neurosurgeon investigators like Michael, myself, and others have had, these are stepping stones towards more sustainable careers. But these stepping stones exist because the field decided to really focus on developing neurosurgeon neuroscientists. And so here we are, the product of that. And at an NIH funding level, the consequence of that is quite evident which is kind of a continuous year over year rise that outpaces any other comparable division or department. And again, just reflects the merger of these two independent paths together in a unified career path. Now, I think so far that narrative should be um, pretty familiar for, to most people who have been in the field for any number of years. Um, what's less commonly recognized though, is that as there was a rise of the neurosurgeon, neuroscientist, we've now been past that plateau. And now it's quite clear that that surge has come to an end. There are still certainly neurosurgeon, neuroscientists in existence in spades. And there are certainly young neurosurgeons coming out of training that will continue on that road. But the number of new neurosurgeon, neuroscientists is declining year after year which is probably a natural evolution of any trend, us reaching a steady state kind of existence within the field. But it does sort of beg the question, why would this happen? It's not because it's an ineffective model, but if you think about it within the context of, for example, neurosurgical oncology, what is the purpose of being a neurosurgeon, neuroscientist or neurosurgeon investigator it's really to impact the disease that we treat in ways that we can't surgically or clinically, right? We develop laboratory efforts, clinical trials, clinical outcome studies, device developments, et cetera. We pursue those things because we're trying to push the envelope for our patients and move the needle on disease. And when you think about that in the context of neurosurgical oncology, it's maybe not surprising that since the needle hasn't moved all that much, some people are reassessing whether this is the right strategy or the only strategy to pursue as a career or even as a global strategy within the field. And so here you see survival curves for glioblastoma in the US over 20 years being effectively indistinguishable for all comers. And we ask ourselves, what can we do to change this? Well. We can begin on the clinical side and then answer that question towards the scientific side. But on the clinical side, we know that neurosurgeons like ourselves first try to tackle this problem from simply, you know, a surgical efficacy perspective. And there was a proliferation of extended resection studies in the last two, three decades that really pushed the envelope and demonstrated one that we needed to be very effective at removing contrast enhancement in high-grade gliomas, two, that the more we remove, the better, and three, that we had to balance morbidity with that. But of course, that itself is not a solution to this disease. So more surgeons started to push the envelope even further. Why remove contrast enhancement? Why not take parts of the flare? Does that help the patient? And the short answer is, sometimes it does. It depends on the circumstances and investigational groups like these led by neurosurgeons have told us that there are radiographic features that lend themselves to flare resection versus not. But of course, removing the flare itself still isn't curative. And so other neurosurgeons have asked the question, what if we go beyond the flare and remove entire regions of the brain, lobes of the brain, supratotal resections? 
And the question is, does this help move the needle? And the answer is sometimes it can, but it depends on the circumstances and the patient. And so beyond maximizing cytoreduction, you know, we asked the question, what about making these operations safer? What about using intraoperative technology to advance our ability to impact the patient? And so we have stimulation mapping, which is not new, of course. We have fluorescence guided surgery, which is a newer technique. And beyond that, we have advanced intraoperative devices like intraoperative ultrasound, 3D ultrasound, intraoperative CT, intraoperative MR. So we have really come in an incredibly long way as a profession in terms of our ability to change the reality in the operating room. But I think we all know that that by itself is really not enough. And we've all seen patients like this, people who were healthy in life, really didn't expect anything untoward to happen. And then suddenly on a Friday, they have a seizure and they have a huge kind of holotemporal lobe, parietal lobe mass. And on Saturday, they go through one craniotomy to go from the back and remove the posterior portion of this. And then the next day they come back and they get another craniotomy and go transylvian and remove the anterior portion of this. And basically what it shows you is how far we've come as a profession where we can put patients through this and they not only survive, but they thrive for a period of time. And their scans can go from a horrible, really threatening scenario to something that actually looks fairly normal and really with no, for example, contrast enhancement or anything like that. And yes, they look like a truck hit them the morning after that weekend, but they're up and they're moving and they're interacting and they're recovering. And that's where really the trouble starts because all of that effort that we put in and the patient put in to surviving this is being undone even before the patient has left the operating room. It's being undone at a microscopic level while we tell patients that their scans are stable, knowing that there's really no such thing as a stable scan. And knowing that a few months later in this unmethylated patient, they're gonna have a recurrence after our standard of care treatment, and then they're going to pass away as this patient did about two months ago. So this is a real problem for us, and this is part of the problem we need to solve in whatever career path we take. And certainly as a neurosurgeon investigator, this has to be some of our objective. Now, the reason this affects us so fundamentally speaking from personal experience, and I'm sure speaking on behalf of many of my colleagues, is that we are the primary care doctors for these patients. We are their go-to for resources. We are the ones that lead their care. And we are the ones that really try as much as possible to save them. And the patients recognize that. And here you have a self-reported uh, uh, poll on where we rank relative to other people and specialties in the lives of our patients. And not surprisingly, we rank much higher than the clinical neuro-oncologist, much higher than the radiation oncologist, much higher than even their primary care physician. So the responsibility is ours really to solve this problem, even if it's not a purely surgical problem. Now, if we think back to the evolution of investigation for neurosurgeons like us, we can see this gradual progression. And I think it's very important, especially for the younger generations to recognize how this field has evolved over the years. It really started as a field where we simply just did what we could in the operating room to get patients through a craniotomy without hurting them to a stage where we started to ask questions about, well, what do we know about these patients and our results? other than anecdotal evidence and you know, personal histories that are revealed at meetings, what do we know at a real scientific level? And so the first clinical outcome studies started to proliferate within our field 
I've singled out Fred Barker here as one of the arbiters of that, but really there were many, many heroes in this era. You see some of them on this publication from what's called the Glioma Outcome Study, which is one of the early and largest prospective outcome studies for neurosurgical oncology, hundreds of patients, hundreds of surgeons, and probably the largest network of clinical sites working together. You see authors like Suzanne Chang, who has long been one of the premier neuro-oncologists in the field, Mitch Berger, Henry Brem, et cetera. And what these individuals did was say, look, we need to have some sort of standardization here. The things that we take for granted today, like an MRI within 24 hours of surgery, the use of Decadron postoperatively, the use and non-use of, of anti-epileptic drugs pre and postoperatively, all of those practices came from these early efforts. We didn't know them before then. So these were the initial organized efforts at real robust neurosurgical investigation at a field level. And even in those early days, we were quite ambitious as a field to push the envelope when it came to impacting the disease beyond a surgical result. And here's one example of Dr. Sandeep Kunwar, who's a neurosurgical oncologist, pituitary surgeon at UCSF, who back in the early 2000s was leading one of the largest networked efforts for adjuvant therapy in glioblastoma, which was the IL-13 trial, which was called the PRECISE trial. Now, this was an incredibly ambitious effort at, at, at that time and even today, where patients would have convection-enhanced delivery catheters implanted and then remaining in for 96 hours while they stayed in the ICU and had these infusions of this conjugated IL-13. So incredibly complicated effort led by a neurosurgical oncologist and a team of investigators that included neurosurgeons. Ultimately, the therapy didn't work, but even today, it stands as one of the most ambitious examples of a, of a surgical intervention combined with a medical intervention. And so as I described earlier, alongside these individual efforts was a field level rise in neurosurgeons that were not only interested in neuroscience, but they were neuroscientists. They didn't just collaborate with neuroscientists and partner with them in the laboratory, they led the laboratory. And so I've, again, highlighted three people, Dr. Brems, Dr. Drs. Brem, Kioka, and Sampson, but there are many, many others. And all of them really set the foundation for the types of efforts that we see today from the younger generation. And these were legitimate neurosurgeons and legitimate neuroscientists playing in both sandboxes equally. And alongside the laboratory neuroscience component rose really rigorous prospective studies. These are controlled trials at this point. Observational studies like those by Dr. Jacala that answered questions that again, we, we sometimes take for granted today. Like what is the value of waiting on a newly diagnosed low-grade glioma. Should we operate today? Should we biopsy and wait? Should we observe with MR? Well, at a level of rigor that approaches level one evidence, he and his team really answered that question for us. This is not a skill set that you learn in a neurosurgical residency. This is a skill set that is really a consequence of acquiring additional knowledge and specialty expertise beyond you know, what you were trained in residency. And we can take this one step further to actually getting drugs approved as a consequence of the neurosurgical oncologist effort. We're all familiar with Dr. Stumer and the efforts in his phase three multicenter study in Germany with 5-ALA. We know that today 5-ALA is part of the standard of care for glioblastoma. We know that it effectively increases the extent of resection we know that it simultaneously increases overall survival as a consequence of that. So what he did in a really rigorous, high-level way was demonstrate not only that the drug improves the surgical result, but that the surgical result improves outcome. This is probably still one of the best pieces of level one evidence in support of extended resection. And as a consequence, he's one of the few, if not the only, neurosurgeon 
to have his work lead to a European approval of a drug and then largely underpin the efforts along with Dr. Haja Panayas to get the FDA approval 10 years later. So we have touched in our field all sorts of domains from the surgical and beyond with our investigational efforts. But the final frontier is really the one that vexes us the most, which is the adjuvant therapy options for our patients. The fact that we have one drug and not much else to hang our hat on. So we look at the drugs that are FDA approved since 1982, and we can very quickly in a single slide run right through them. We have two agents from the early 80s that are derivatives, derivatives of mustard gas. So these are straight up poisons that we hope will hurt the tumor cells faster than it hurts the patient. We have a VEGF inhibitor that makes scans look better and has some anti-edema effects, but no clear anti-tumor effects that lead to a survival benefit in the upfront setting. Nevertheless, of course, it's been approved. And then we have Everlimus, which is an effective drug for a very rare tumor, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. So that leaves us with really Temidar. And many of us are already familiar with the story of Temidar because we associate it with Roger Stoops' randomized phase three study in conjunction with radiotherapy. And we've all memorized this survival curve but what many of us don't really realize is this was 2005. This was not a huge surprise, not even a little bit of a surprise at that time. And that's because the drug had been around for over an, a dozen years prior and through investigators at Caring Cross and other centers in UK and Europe, it was already quite evident that this drug was doing something. Here's the first report of the drug back when we didn't even use MRIs to track brain tumors, we used contrasted CT scans. And even in a dozen patients, it was pretty obvious that something very special was happening. Because back then, and even today, you don't give a dozen patients a drug and not only see radiographic improvement that you can appreciate on a CT scan, which has to be pretty substantial, but you see clinical improvement as well in these same patients at a time when no patient clinically improved from anything. And this was 93, okay? A full 12 years before the phase three study. And this group and others went on to look at larger cohorts of patients in phase one, twos, and the survival curves were quite obvious. So here you have 75 patients showing you quite clearly that this is doing something, okay? Now, the question I would leave with you is, why did it take us 12 years to get to that next step? If you had a glioblastoma in 1996, you probably were not getting this drug, which is a problem. Now, if we go to the other end of the spectrum and we talk about Everlimus, this is a drug that obviously, like most of our drugs, was not developed for brain tumors, but because of what we know about the mTOR pathway, within subependymal giant cell astrocytoma and within tuberous sclerosis, which as many of you know, is an autosomal dominant pediatric syndrome, you know, anywhere from five to 20% of them develop these tumors. And they're led by this TSC12 mutation that leads to this continuously active mTORC1. Everlimus is an mTORC1 inhibitor, so it stands to reason it should help it. And in fact, it did. And here's the first five patients. They have the tumors, they haven't had surgery, they haven't had radiation, you give them the drug, tumor disappears. Turn the drug off, tumor comes back, turn the drug on, tumor disappears. And all we had to do at that point was go to a small sample size, 28 patient, phase one, two, and it was quite clear that you not only had disease stability, but in a large, major large subset of patients, you had a complete reduction in the tumor volume. Today, this is virtually a curative drug and surgery really has very little role for these patients. So here we have a small sample size study that really had an outsized impact. Now the Avastin story, many of us are somewhat familiar with because of the large scale studies that were negative, but 
the basis for its approval is, is a lesser known story and really revolved around a small scale randomized phase two. And in this randomized phase two, the FDA agreed to move the goalposts and rather use, rather than use survival as an endpoint, they agreed to use an imaging response in a, as an endpoint, which we all know in retrospect was um, not the right move. And it's ironic that today with the Alzheimer drug controversy that we find ourselves in a similar situation. But at the time they had this drug and they had these kinds of remarkable radiographic responses. Now, the randomized phase two, you know, wasn't telling us that there was some survival benefit to this. 36 month, six month PFS, you know, a 9.3 month overall survival, that's not, those are not great numbers. And at the time, we also knew that these radiographic responses were happening in 24 hours. And we know these tumors are not disappearing in 24 hours. But nevertheless, because of the enormous pressure that exists on the FDA, the fact that as a field, we are desperate for something to be used. This was approved through accelerated approval in 07 with the stipulation that a follow-on study be done at the randomized phase three level. And as we all know, there were two studies done nationally and internationally with thousands of patients and those did not show a survival benefit. So why is it that it is so hard to move the needle with adjuvant therapies in this field? Well, you know, it begins with the obvious, which is it's complicated. The biology is complicated. You can look at that at any level. When I was a resident at UCSF and I told one of the faculty who was a trauma surgeon that I want to go into neurosurgical oncology and I want to have a laboratory effort in that, we met in his office and he showed me a normal karyotype of the human chromosomal spread. And alongside it, he showed me one of a human glioblastoma. And he looked at me and he said, you're going to fix this? And it's a totally valid point. Biologically, this disease is a disaster. There are no clear driver mutations. It's highly mutative and incredibly heterogeneous. And we can go on and on about all the narratives that exist as to why there's biological challenges here. I think for this audience, you recognize it. But beyond the biological challenges, we're also not really trying that hard to cure this disease because universities don't develop drugs. Laboratories, academic medical centers don't develop drugs. Industry develops drugs. And the industry goes where its shareholders and opportunities are. And that's not a criticism, that's reality. But if you look today at the market sizes for any major cancer, you can predict almost to the number how many new drugs are going to be developed and approved for that cancer. There is a one-to-one -one relationship in the productivity of new agents to the size of the market. And there is a one-to-one -one relationship and the survival benefit for patients. And that's what you see here. You see here over a four year period, the improvements or worsening of survival in patients with different cancers. And you see in the red, patients with brain cancer who really haven't done any better over this period. And then you see the tremendous gains in, for example, breast, lung, and melanoma over the same period. And these things are related. Now, looking again within our field, we have to be honest with ourselves and recognize that our own coordinated efforts haven't necessarily contributed to some ultimate solution either. In the early 90s, the National Cancer Institute very deliberately shifted from late phase trials to early phase trials. And it was really a recognition that we don't know enough about this disease to be doing a lot of randomized studies quite yet. So they asked us to emphasize phase one twos and a lot of correlative studies there. And after several years of that, they funded three major consortia to focus on these types of problems. And about five years after that, they pared that down to two consortia. And about 11 years after that, 
the 10 years, they pair that down to one consortia. And then finally, they ended the last consortium just this past calendar year. The ABTC was defunded by the NCI, its, it's grant not renewed. And when the ABTC presented its kind of summary results at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which as many of you know, is the, the, the largest cancer meeting in the US every year, this is how they summarized their accomplishments, which were a lot of meetings, a lot of trials, a lot of grants, a lot of papers, but no drugs. Now it's not a criticism, it's a reality, but it shows us the work that needs to be done when it comes to coordinated efforts. And coordinated efforts themselves don't exist in a vacuum because they're often funded by, and in many cases led by the industry who are the source of the reagents for our experiments. And I've just sort of randomly chosen one of many promising industry-sponsored efforts. This is for a, um, an oncolytic virus, a modified oncolytic virus. And what this uh, caricature kind of projects is that you inject the virus into the tumor, it creates some cell kill, and then that cell kill itself releases a shower of antigens that if you combine with a checkpoint inhibitor or some immune stimulatory mechanism, We'll take advantage of that. So as with many promising strategies, it makes scientific sense. But they conducted a phase two, a multi-center phase two, and the objective response rate, which is when the scans either decrease in size or completely resolve for the mass, was less than 12%, and the overall survival was 12 and a half. So for those of you familiar looking at this kind of data, you know, those are uh, commonplace numbers. I'm going to show you a video, and it's kind of a video of a video, so I would encourage you to turn your volume up of the presentation of this work at this last SNOW meeting, Society for Neuro-Oncology, by uh, a friend and a colleague, Dr. Gela Rizade, who is a neurosurgeon neuroscientist that was one of several involved in this trial. And she's going to present the last slide summarizing their assessment of the strategy and next step. And then there's going to be a little interaction between her and the moderator, Dr. David Schiff, who is a, a, a well-regarded clinical neuro-oncologist. So, so overall, our results, I think, are promising. There are no DLTs observed. The median treatment duration is 5.3 months, and the tolerability of this is better, for example, compared to prior checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, this is a higher uh, effective tolerance. Adverse events were all able to be managed medically, and the median survival is 12.5 months, with a clinical benefit rate of approximately 55%. At this point, a uh, phase three study is planned, and we hope that we can start opening the study in the new year of 2020. I'd like to thank all of the centers for participating in this trial and also acknowledge the uh, uh, contributions that were made to show that the study was successful. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Gail, very, very nice work. Um, first question is for me. Um, is, is, are the data compelling enough to go to a phase three? Um, the simple answer I would say, David, is yes. In particular, as I showed you, the results that we have quite promising, and I think we have uh, good uh, support for going on to phase three. Based on the uh, objective response rate of 12% or based on the overall survival of 12 and a half months? Both. Would you, would you consider doing a, a randomized phase two? So here you see the intellectual tensions that exist and the discourse that exists within our field. You have the clinical neuro-oncologist asking the investigator, what exactly is the logic behind going through a randomized phase three, which is a huge undertaking, will cost millions of dollars, will require a lot of patience, and, 
this is an interventional study where viral injection is necessary. And there's really no real answer there. Uh, you know, the, 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 the radiographic results are marginal, the survival results are marginal, but the reason it's probably going to go forward is because this is a massive effort and it's been invested in in terms of time as well as money by the investigators and the companies. And so they want to push ahead. And so this is part of the challenge we have in this field is it's difficult to really pivot away. You know, we are so resilient and resolved in succeeding that sometimes that comes at our own expense. And I think that's uh, embodied really eloquently in this um, commentary by Dr. DeAngelis from Sloan Kettering, where she basically reminds us that when a study is negative or not profoundly positive, your natural response shouldn't be to hash through the data and find some post hoc analysis that gives you a thread to move forward. Your first instinct should be to ask yourself, should we move forward at all? Now, that question itself is the basis for what I think will be an increasing number of strategies and studies within the neurosurgical oncology community, and that's based around tissue-based trialing. And tissue-based trialing in its most kind of basic form is really just humanizing the laboratory question and data set. It's asking questions in patients that you would normally ask in, 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 in preclinical models. And the simplest version of that is what's called a window of opportunity study. And it, it's a study that sounds exactly like its name. You have a patient on a drug long-term, at some point they happen to need an operation while they're on the drug. And so that operation is a window of opportunity to get tissue and ask some basic questions about the drug. Like, did the drug get there, pharmacokinetics, or did it hit its target, pharmacodynamics? And window of opportunity studies often happen later in the genesis of a drug, but an earlier version of that is what's typically referred to as a phase zero study or an exploratory IND study or a PKPD driven early phase study. And in these studies, the purpose of the drug exposure is really for the surgery where you're not giving someone drug to have a clinical effect, you're just giving them enough so that when they go to surgery, just typically hours or days after a few doses, you can ask important questions like pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic questions. And in the medical oncology field where a lot of this is done, these two terms and strategies overlap to some extent, but they're not the same thing. And phase zero studies are often earlier phase studies. They often involve just days or a single dose of drug, and they're certainly non-therapeutic. What we do know is that within neuro-oncology, these kinds of studies rarely happen. And in the last 50 years, there have only been 22 papers in our field examining tumor PD, pharmacodynamics, or PK, pharmacokinetics in GBM. And this is because it's complicated. Because if you're doing this in a lung cancer patient, you can do a needle biopsy on Monday, give them the drug on Tuesday, do a needle biopsy on Wednesday, and that's your study. But for someone that needs a craniotomy, you're talking about developing pharmacokinetic methods that rarely exist in any field or any center in the US, and operating room synchronization that has to be to the minute. You can't say the patient's gonna have a craniotomy between four and 8 p.m. You need to know exactly when that tumor is gonna be removed. And these are non-therapeutic studies, right? These are studies where you're giving the drug, but there's no therapeutic intent. And that's challenging from a, just a patient standpoint. And of course, for neurosurgeons like us, getting access to drug and getting the clinical training necessary for this is not always available. So what we and others have done is try to redefine this paradigm so it's just more practical and applicable in real neurosurgical oncology and neuro-oncology. 
So the phase zero model that I showed you, the pure phase zero, it's non-therapeutic, and you're really just getting PKPD data. So you don't get any signal in terms of clinical result. You don't get any data in terms of biological resistance. It's just the flash exposure. And so what we do now at the IV Center is really what's called a phase zero trigger trial, where patients present with a tumor, they go through a genetic screen that matches them to some new in class drug, drug cocktail, drug device combination. And then they go on to a timed operation and that tissue from the operation is then used to activate one of three triggers for the trial. It could be a, a PK trigger where we decide we need to see a certain amount of drug in the tumor, a PD trigger or a combination of the two. And the purpose of the trigger is to, is to select which patient is gonna go on to longitudinal prolonged therapeutic regimens of that therapy. And then those patients go on and get the drug until they have a tumor recurrence or indefinitely. Now you have the ability to ask some real formalized questions in a homogenous data set with long-term data on clinical efficacy, safety, and even on drug resistance. Now these studies are small and designed to go quickly. And they're designed to tell you what strategies to pursue and what to let go of. So the statistics reflect that. We are looking for high signal to noise. We are not looking for the next agent that adds eight weeks of overall survival. We're looking for the next Temidar, something where it's quite obvious that something is happening. And we are also dispensing with this very anachronistic concept of phase one studies, where you're looking for the MTD, which as we all know is the maximum tolerated dose. This paradigm was from the chemotherapy regimens of the past, where you would give patients as much drug as they could physically tolerate, and you would assume that if you could get them to that level, then that must be the best thing for them. The more drug in them, the better until you hit a toxicity ceiling. But we know now that with modern drugs, that's not how drugs work at all. It's not about some linear scale of effect. It's usually some Gaussian curve, some bell curve, where there's a sweet spot for drug effect. Why? Because these aren't chemotherapeutic agents, they're targeted agents. And so there are recursive pathways downstream that will be modulated differentially depending on how hard you hit them. So we have to find this optimal biological dose, and you can't find that by just looking for toxicity. That's where you have to find pharmacokinetic and dynamic data to tell yourself, okay, this is the drug dose that needs to be used. And this is the effect I'm seeing in this patient's tissue. And therefore I can have some confidence to move on with this patient in the trial. So what these trials do is they clarify all of the uncertainty that we live with in the biology of human brain cancer and its response to the treatments because animal models will never accurately predict and have never in the history of our field accurately predicted a clinical trial result. So real life examples, we can start with this one. This is a CDK4-6 inhibitor, which is a drug that was recently developed for breast cancer and really works in breast cancer. And it was a paradigm shifting event in the field to have the ability to modulate the cell cycle in this way. So we know a lot about it. We know what kinds of tumors and their biologies are receptive to this. And so we and other groups have looked at this in a monotherapy setting, us as a phase zero trigger trial. And we have all concluded that as a monotherapy, this has no effect. Not a big surprise to anyone in the audience. But the question is, where do you go from there? Why doesn't it have an effect? We can see in our study that the drug is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But we also know that there are downstream pathways and many of them, in fact. And the question is, which one or ones are responsible for the resistance? So this is a question you can only answer in this kind of study design, where the patients go on the drug long-term, they have a recurrence, you bring them back and you test that tissue again, you say, what's changed? And in fact, what's changed is this, is this ras erc pathway. So then you very logically proceed to the next trial where you're hitting both pathways at once. So here you have a CDK4-6 inhibitor and an ERK inhibitor together 
You select the patients based on molecular criteria. You expose them to the drugs in a timed fashion. You measure drug concentrations, not total drug, not total drug, unbound drug, because unbound drug is what's usually pharmacologically relevant. When you take a drug into your system, the vast majority of it binds to albumin and other proteins in your bloodstream, and it's inert. So you need the free fraction to understand how well a drug is actually getting into a tumor. So we measure that in the tumors. And for those who have sufficient levels of both drugs, then those patients go on to get the cocktail. So this is what the data from these trials look like. Up until now, I've shown you trials. And what have I shown you? Radiographic data, survival curves. Those are indirect endpoints. You know, other than the statistical arguments underpinning them, there's no clear linear relationship between a drug exposure and a survival curve, unless you're talking about large numbers. But here we see, okay, these are the concentrations of drugs in these patients. And the ones in red are the ones where the tumor concentration in non-enhancing tissue, right? The tissue that really matters because we can all resect the enhancing tissue. The red bar, non-enhancing tissue goes above that dotted line, which is our target. That's drug one. What about drug two? Well, this is the ERK inhibitor, not quite as effective, but nevertheless, in some patients, they're both getting in. So here we're learning incredible amounts of detail for these new drugs that you would never get in any other model system. And that for most conventional trialing approaches, they don't even get or ask. They just rely on in silico analyses or preclinical data. But here we know, okay, this is the penetrant properties of these drugs. So what happens to the targets? Well, without belaboring the biology of it, the answer is you can see very well what happens to the targets. And you can even be brutally honest with yourself and say, when we're looking at target effect, let's not just look at the tumor now versus the first time it was resected months ago. Let's look at the tumor immediately pre and post drug exposure where we give them a needle biopsy before the drug, we give them the drug, and then we take them to the OR. And here we see that in fact, for one target, the CDK4-6, we're seeing the intended effect, but for the other target, not. And then we go on to the clinical profile of patients that have had enough drug in them to really justify long-term treatment. And you can see that the long-term treatment so far, this is incomplete data that we presented at ASCO just a few months ago, is still unimpressive. So we have to continue to mature that data, but it gives you an idea of how you can read the tea leaves for these drugs. Now, glioblastoma is obviously one problem we have, but let's be honest, there are many, many other incurable brain cancers and malignant and, and multiply recurrent atypical meningiomas are one of them. And there are no adjuvant therapies for these patients. And so here we're using a similar strategy trial-wise a different drug, a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and using a combination trigger of PK plus PD and taking these patients into the clinic when they get enough drug in them and then saying, okay, how are they doing? Well, what the field tells us is that in an aggressive meningioma, the median PFS of 35% is what you would expect. Here, we see double that. And we see double that not only in grade twos, but in grade threes. And in grade threes, we see an incredible PK response to the drug. So now we have signal in the noise. We have a small sample set of patients where we not only know that the drug's getting in, but we know that it is having, you know, a fairly obvious clinical response in patients that you don't expect to see in this population of multiply operated on, multiply radiated tumors. So at this point, you dispense with all of the other hand wringing, it's 1993 and you don't wait until 2005, you go straight to the FDA and to the drug company and you say, let's talk about a pivotal randomized phase two. There's never been an adjuvant therapy approved for this indication in malignant meningioma. So we're gonna do this as a newly diagnosed randomized phase two in grade three patients and we're going to get the answer and we're gonna set the bar high so that we don't need a lot of patients. So this is how the go, no go, red light, green light concept works. 
This is a study that's now getting underway at our site and a handful of other sites, and it will be done in a couple years, and we will know the answer. Now, I'm showing you drug strategies because that's what we think of in adjuvant therapies, but the fact is that drugs are not the only tool we have in our arsenal, and as neurosurgeons, we're probably as aware of that as anyone else. And many of us are also aware that worldwide and in the U.S., the single most effective by numbers modality we have at our disposal is not surgery, it's radiation. And it's not only the most effective, it's the most prescribed and the most accessible everywhere. So modulating radiotherapy to get more out of it is something that we have to be participatory in. And that begins with us understanding the biology of DNA damage and then taking different mechanisms and interrogating them, trying to manipulate that biology in the setting of radiation response. So these are just a handful of trials that we have either open or opening this calendar year at the Ivy Center that simply modulate the DNA damage response in conjunction with conventional radiation. And the way these trials work are simple. And here's one with a PARP inhibitor from Beijing where we take patients and they could be newly diagnosed or recurrent. We expose them to the drug and this is probably the first phase zero study in newly diagnosed gliomas I think that's ever been undertaken. And then we measure drug concentrations, and then we take them on to the phase two. And here, we're not only measuring drug concentrations, but we're, what are we asking? We're asking, is there real synergy between this drug and radiation? So the question is not, did the drug hit its target? The question is, is there synergy? And that's not a difficult thing to assess, but it's something we do through what's called functional pharmacodynamics, where the tissue comes out of the OR and it's already been exposed to drug. And then we subdivide it and radiate it and keep a control. And we then measure the consequence of the convergence of that radiation with the drug together. And the results so far have been eye-opening and this story remains to be told. But the point is that this is how we're going to get at real manipulation of a, of a biologically complicated disease. And drug radiation is not the only version of multimodal strategy. Drug device is, a, is one that's commonly top of mind. And we all know that tumor metabolism is one kind of aspect of vulnerability for any cancer. And obviously today, that dialogue is really revolving around IDH1 and those types of manipulations. But there's another way to, to exploit tumor metabolism. And it actually takes us back to our old friend 5ALA, which as we all know, is something that you ingest the morning of surgery, it gets metabolized in tumor cells and normal cells. And in tumor cells, it gets stuck at a byproduct called portoporphyrin-9, and it's highly selective in its accumulation of portoporphyrin-9. And there is a hypothesis, a theory, of a phenomenon called sonoluminescence. And that theory is this. If you're able to deliver low-energy, non-ablative, non-thermal ultrasound to a patient's tissue, at a certain energy and frequency, that ultrasound will resonate at the molecular level and at the cell membrane level and cause the release of microscopic or submicroscopic photons at the site of the target. And those photons will intersect with portoporphyrin 9. And that intersection leads to a phenomenon called photodynamic effect, which is already well-documented. And basically, it's the realization that when you activate portoporphyrin 9 with light, it becomes cytotoxic through the formation of reaction and oxygen species, and it kills the tumor. And this is very well known, actually. If you have a basal cell carcinoma in Europe, in your skin, and you need it treated, you don't just get it cut out. For many patients, they take ALA, they get the blue light shined on it, and it kills a tumor over time. So here I'm going to show you a brief video of our first in human 5-ALA sonodynamic therapy trial. And I'm showing it to you so that you see the device that's being used. It's 
convergence with the drug and pay attention to how this device has to have this membrane around the patient's head that fills with water so that the energy of the ultrasound is not dissipated as it goes into the brain tissue. Today is our first patient for sonodynamic therapy in our phase zero clinical trial. This is the first in human study. So sonodynamic therapy is a combination of a drug and a device. It's non-invasive, doesn't require an operation. A patient with a malignant brain tumor gets this drug the morning of the procedure, and then there is a frame placed on the patient's head, fixed to the patient's skull. It's done with local anesthetic, so it's painless. The patient doesn't feel any discomfort. And then following- There's the water. The patient goes into the MRI scanner and gets attached to the sonodynamic therapy device. So this trial is ongoing, and how do you, how do you answer the question when there is no real precedent for this kind of mechanism in humans? And the way you do it is that you take patients with recurrent tumors that are going to the operating room, and you put them into this phase zero one study, and you treat half of their tumor, and you leave the other half as an internal control. And then you resect that tumor several days later on block, and you have a perfect paradigm for whether you're seeing reactive oxygen species and ROS-induced cell death, where you would expect it or not. And this is still a complicated set of experiments because you're giving the patient the drug, maybe on a Monday, they then go through the MR-guided focused ultrasound later that morning, and then you need to see evidence of these very ephemeral transient biochemical processes. And you need that to coincide with the evidence of cell death. So you do some modeling as we have, and you arrive at the estimate that four days after the exposure, there should be a convergence of these things. And the results of this trial and others that I've shared with you will be presented in the coming months at SNOW, at ESMO. But the point is, that there should be no one hook that we're hanging our efforts onto. It should be just a number of parallel tracks like these trials that we're opening in the next calendar year at the Ivy Center, all focusing on different strategies that are biologically sound, but that you don't need to make an entire horse race out of. You simply need a go, no go assessment of as to the promise of the therapy. And most of these, in this sort of gladiator academy of new therapies will fall by the wayside and that's okay. So in the final few minutes, I just wanna to touch on what this means for people in the audience, especially those who are in training, aspiring to be in training or just out of training. And the point is just like in generations past, we need to be prepared for what's coming ahead of us. We need to grasp this sort of future and manipulate it. So learning to be an excellent brain tumor surgeon from a technical clinical standpoint, that is just the prerequisite. There's nothing special about that. That is what we should expect of ourselves coming out of training and being in practice. But beyond that, we need to understand what everyone else is doing with our patients. If you're a neurosurgical oncologist, and you're not clear on the paradigms of side effect management for your clinical neurooncologist when they're giving your patients drugs, you need to be. If you're not clear on the radiobiology and physics of the radio surgery that you're delivering or that is being delivered to your patients, you need to. Just like if you're an awake mapping surgeon, you need to know what the anesthetics are and what the job of the anesthesiologist is so that you can understand how that's affecting your results. You need to know what the neuromonitoring folks are doing or not doing. You need to know what the operating room techs are doing or not doing. The same is true here. And when you have this multidisciplinary skill set, which is not something that conventional training programs teach you, you have to take the time to spend it with these other specialties. Then you can make multidisciplinary decisions but not only that, anticipate multidisciplinary problems. And as you can see, you know, I hate to say it for those of us that never want to hear about a molecule or a mechanism 
and never want to find themselves in a laboratory. And you don't need to run a laboratory to be able to do this, but you do need to understand the science. That is not optional in our space. So at the Barrow, we fashioned an early stage neurosurgical oncology rotation with the idea being that these are principles and paradigms that you need to ingrain into trainees from the very beginning. And the basis for it was very much my experience and our experience at UCSF, where as a PGY2 for many years, you would spend that with Dr. Berger in the operating room. And in that operating room, you will learn a lot and see a lot beyond just surgical and technical results. You would understand how to conduct yourself, be a professional, present yourself with that sort of mantra. You would understand how the clinic relates to the operating room. And increasingly in our rotation, you're spending time in the clinic to understand the decision-making and the consequences of the decisions. And of course, you're in the operating room itself, but you're also understanding this transition from inpatient to outpatient care, which no one teaches you, but is one of the most common sources of medical problems and patients going awry every day. And you're engaging in these other disciplines like radio surgery. And on our rotation here, you're going to publish. It's not a suggestion. It's mandatory. And on our rotation here, you're going to get exposed to the science. You don't need to be a scientist, but we need you to understand the language, speak the language, and use the scientific method, just like these generations of neurosurgeons that preceded you have. So I think the future is quite bright for our profession. I think we have another gear to kick into. The Barrow itself has become kind of a fertile opportunity for this. The Ivy Center, as some of you may know, is a drug development program that we've developed to really focus on early phase studies, preclinical and clinical. And soon there'll be a 70,000 square foot building to really house this entire effort on five floors to focus us and really give us the single largest center in the world just trained on developing new therapies for malignant brain cancer. So I appreciate your patience and me running a little over time. I'll thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you so much. That was a, a fantastic talk. And I think it really just highlights the importance of thinking outside of the box, uh, recognizing all of our failures and figuring out that we, we just can't keep doing the same thing and, and whatnot. Uh, just a couple questions before I open up to the panels is, you know, uh, you, you talked about how you don't need to have a lab as a neurosurgeon scientist to kind of run these trials and perhaps to run a, a clinical trial through the NIH. W what would be kind of your like first couple steps that you would recommend to an, a, a young faculty member who's just getting their new job who wants to kind of uh, start, be more involved in these clinical trials who are typically in many centers just run by neuro-oncologists only? Right. So, I mean, I think I would just convey my experience, which was, as you know, Michael, I graduated from UCSF in 09. I did a one-year fellowship with Dr. Spetzler until 2010, and then I joined here as faculty, and I did what I was trained to do. I started a laboratory. It was RO1 funded. It continues to be, it's a glioma stem cell lab, and I had my clinical practice, and I had my basic science practice. And after five or six years, I started to question how much my laboratory was helping my clinical patients. And that's when I realized I needed to enter this space, but there was no roadmap. So what I did was probably what most of us would do. I looked outside of the field and I realized that in medical oncology, these types of trials are commonplace. So I found a mentor in medical oncology and her name is Pat LaRusso. She's the deputy director of the Yale Cancer Center. And at the time she was in Michigan and I convinced her that I was serious. I reached out to her. I had her fly out to Phoenix, I flew out to her, and I just learned. And I continued kind of the trajectory of learning that you have in residency, but it maintained it as faculty. And I spent more and more time with folks like her, and I tried to adapt those lessons to the field. And I realized that it doesn't matter what your profession is, we can all do anything we want 
as long as we're good at it. So I, I think you don't need to, to your point, run a lab. You don't need to have a PhD. You don't need to be a clinical neuro-oncologist. You just need to put in the effort to learn the principles of it. And unfortunately, that's possible today. And then uh, my other question is just a little more technical. Uh, you know, we, we know that GBM is so heterogeneous and that's why we've had so many issues with past trials being these shotgun trials, which I think is a lot of what your talk today was focused on the idea of you can't just assume every patient's GBM is the same. You really need to get precision medicine. You really need to understand uh, the, the biomarkers. But, but even within one person's GBM, there is also so much heterogeneity. And so this idea of biopsying one site and making a decision on just one area in the tumor uh, I mean, I'm sure you guys are being very, very specific as to where that one specimen you're biopsying up front is. And, and do you think in the future that we'll be using, you know, radio genomics or other kind of radio signatures to try to understand how to biopsy multiple sites to kind of understand pathways that may be in multiple areas of the tumor to truly combine those therapies to the next step? Yeah, it's a great question. So the short answer is how do we mitigate the problem of intratumoral heterogeneity? And the way we try to mitigate it is, like you said, we predetermine sites based on physiologic MR imaging paradigms, and then we select multiple sites from multiple regions in the same tumor and try to arrive at a, you know, sort of unified picture of what's going on. But I think it touches on a larger question for our field, which is, you know, how do you balance between, you know, simplicity and complexity? For any particular study or trial, you can just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and sometimes that's appropriate, but I think what my, my sense is that we do that too often. You know, the studies that have been done historically in our field should be educational to us. When something works, it's kind of obvious. And if you need to tease it out really meticulously cell by cell, then it's probably not the robust solution you're looking for. And that may not be what people want to hear, especially when some approach has been your life's work. And that's a, that's a different problem in our field, the fact that it incentivizes that kind of approach to science. But, you know, I would say that if it's not slapping you in the face, maybe better to move on to the many, many other untested strategies than to keep trying to sort of tease it out. Yeah, great answer. Uh, so i open up to the panelists, Natesh, Dom, Alexis, Mike. Um, Dr. Hudson, that was that was an amazing talk. And I think... Uh, you know, for someone like me, who's, I mean, you know, I'm one of the brain tumor fellows here with Dr. Komatar and Dr. Ivan, you know, hearing about the exciting stuff like this, which obviously, you know, takes a lot of effort and stuff design. But, um, you know, when I'm going to practice, you know, in about a year, I definitely would obviously be able to do something like this in the first five to 10 years of practice would be amazing. Um, I read through your your Red Journal publication, sort of almost like a guide for neuro -oncolo neurosurgical oncologists using these phase one, phase zero trials, and I had a lot of info in it, which is great. Um, and I wanted, you know, certain sections sort of were interesting to me. And if you could comment on them, specifically, the concept of scientific rigor, sort of law of large, large numbers, and sort of counter arguments, or, uh, or I should say, more like discussion when you compare, let's say, a phase zero trial versus a more traditional thousand, two thousand, three thousand. You know, how do you? And you sort of have that discussion, you know, with institutions or, you know, that haven't had a phase zero trial before. And they're like, well, what is a phase zero trial? How do you approach that with administration getting support at a, at a small hospital? Yeah, well, you know, look, small hospital, big hospital, none of them are familiar with this. So the good news is it's new to everyone. And just like anything else in our surgical field, it just requires you to be a real partner with people. So, you know, when I came to the Barrow in 2010, there were no awake craniotomies here. It wasn't part of the program. Nobody did it. It just wasn't something that was done. And to build an awake mapping program required me to introduce all sorts of people, administrative and clinical to the concept, then to walk everyone through the learning curve and in a multidisciplinary way, just create partnerships that didn't exist. It's the same concept here. You start small. When I did my first phase zero, maybe six years ago, uh, it was a new concept. I had to keep explaining it to people. But you know, people want something new. They get excited by new concepts because it's innovation. And so I would say, don't let it deter you. You know, when you get out into practice, 
you need to keep developing yourself. You know, we have a neurosurgical oncology fellowship here starting this summer, and that's very much going to be part of our program is preparing the fellows, not just for the surgical challenges at hand, but for the non-surgical challenges, spending time with clinical neuro-oncologists, spending time with radiation oncologists, spending time with laboratory scientists and clinical trialists so that you have the vocabulary so that when you get into practice, you can start to you know, shine up your own efforts beyond everything you've learned so far. So I would say there's nothing beyond reach for you. You can absolutely do this. And frankly, look, there's no blueprint here. Um, this has not been done in large numbers. So there's plenty of stuff to learn and discover. And, and that gives you some freedom. That's nice. Thank you. That was a very provocative talk and a, very, a lot of uh, great tidbits for uh, co-fellows with, with uh, Natasha and a lot of tidbits and, and good tips for, you know, uh, up and coming uh, neuro-oncology uh, and uh, neurosurgical oncology uh, fellows and, and upcoming attendings. Uh, I guess I had a two-part question. Um, you know, I, I found it uh, pretty impressive you were able to uh, enroll uh, primary GVMs uh, into your study. Uh, and as something, you know, from, from my experience uh, in, with, with trial design that you kind of hit roadblocks with that. Is that, how did you navigate that with, in terms of uh, approval from both like the IRB and FDA standpoint to um, have that enlisted without a, a, a prior diagnosis? Yeah, so, you know, this is a concept that where the conventional wisdom kind of flies in the face of the reality. You know, a patient who presents with a newly diagnosed suspected glioblastoma is rarely a surgical emergency. You know, we may discuss it with the patient with a sense of urgency, but the fact is there's nothing particularly special about that day where they presented. That thing didn't just grow up the previous day. So the first thing you do is you recontextualize the event to let everyone understand that it's okay to take your time, okay? And so you say, okay, a little bit of time is still clinically and ethically permissible. What can we do within that time? And so what we decided was, if we find drugs where the kinetics of the drug are such that you only need two or three days of the drug before you can go to the OR and detect it, that that was not unreasonable. And you know, think about it like this, okay? When we operate on these newly diagnosed GBMs, 60% of them, okay, are MGMT unmethylated, but they're all getting Temidar, right? So 60% of the tumors you are operating on are going to get effectively a placebo agent alongside radiotherapy. Now, shouldn't we do something to change that? And so that's our argument to the FDA and the IRB, and they've been very receptive, which is, look, we all need something else for this 60%. How are you going to figure it out if the only place we test drugs is when it's this absolute monstrosity at recurrence. Even Temidar didn't really work that well at recurrence. It was in the upfront setting where we detected it. So this is how you narrate it. And it's very reasonable and there's really no uh, red lines around it. It's just a paradigm shift when it comes to the way we've been trained. Yeah, I totally agree. And, um, and a follow-up question, uh, you, you kind of touched on on what I was um, kind of wanted to follow up with you. The, PKs of, of these different drugs are different and, you know, something won't necessarily slap you in the face within a week and, you know, you may need to tease it out a little bit more. So um, do you tailor the phase zero drugs to the ones that have that uh, more likely to have more of an acute phase like reaction is because some of these things are, you know, require a chronic treatment, uh, not because they're necessarily less efficacious, but just because of their own uh, pharmacokinetics? Yeah, that's a great question. So your point is, some drugs take a long time to reach steady state. And you know what do you do with the drug that takes two weeks? And the answer is, it's probably not appropriate for these types of trials. The good thing is most drugs are designed to work fast, but we've seen that tail end. We had a phase zero study for brain mets with a drug that took 10 days to reach steady state. And guess, you know, no surprise, it's hard to find operative brain tumor patients with mets that can wait 10 days. So you know, I think the upper limit of pre-surgical exposure is probably five to seven days, but fortunately that's most drugs. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, great, Dr. Dustin. and I uh, just wanted to ask a question about basically how you can bring up the next generation of neurosurgical residents to find the time to balance uh, working with administration, working, doing their, uh, meeting their clinical responsibilities, but also finding time to do basic science uh, lab research without having to take a time off. Um, I'm not sure if you have any advice on how to, how to balance all those things. Yeah, well, Michael, that's you, right? I mean, you're a, you're a mid-level resident and, you know, how are you going to get all this in, in the subsequent years? You're in the clinic, you're taking call, you know, there's a lot going on. And the answer is, you know, nights and weekends. Um, there's no, you know, way around it. Um, for many of us that have, you know, successful laboratories that are federally funded and sustainable, we took time off in residency, as many of you do, to establish a scientific underpinning for our work, to get some track record in NIH funding, to get at least one high profile publication. So for our residents, what we do is the few that want to go down that road, we plan far in advance. And, you know, Michael will be familiar with this. You know, you know, as a PGY2, when you're going to need to send in your first K99 application, you know, you know, when you're going to need that high profile tier one publication out so that when you interview, you can make a convincing argument to your future chairman that in fact, you're going to be able to develop that scientific program. And during residency, you're in that lab nights and weekends, you know, um, and it's, so it's not for everyone. And I don't think it should be, but for those that have that burning desire, you know, that's the only way that I've seen it done. I don't think I've ever met a neurosurgeon that's gone down that road that hasn't done all those things. Thank you. Very interesting lecture, Dr. and I. Thank you for that. Um, I have two questions. The first one is actually, what do you think is the role of multi-institutional collaborations in these exploratory phase zero studies? And what recommendations do you have for smaller programs that want to participate? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think as I alluded to in the talk, I'm somewhat skeptical about multi-center studies. There's a degree of inefficiency that happens there that many of us are familiar with that is really a killer and not through lack of effort or intent. It's just complicated. So I think single center studies at, at relatively high volume centers are very feasible. But I also think that there is a role for quote unquote smaller centers to really participate in this. The fact is that when you look at the consortia for many of these brain tumor programs, it's the same 10 or 15 programs every time. And if you look at those 10 or 15 programs, they are so chock full competing protocols and priorities that it's difficult for them to get anything done because they keep layering on more and more commitments. So in fact, I think the solution is to go to programs that aren't typically part of that club and to say, look, you know, you're a medium-sized program in a community. I know that you as a neurosurgeon or neuro-oncologist really want to affect this disease and be part of the solution. So let's work together because I know that at your center, there's going to be less bureaucracy, there's going to be less protocol competition. And because you know, you're not the first person that everyone calls when they want to create their latest consortium, you're probably going to be more motivated to really make this project happen. So for our randomized phase two study, and for example, abemaciclib and malignant meningiomas, you know, we approached health systems and centers that aren't typically part of the mix, like Atlantic Health in New Jersey, which is a large healthcare system that services a lot of brain tumor patients, but is not really part of that academic cadre that we normally um, kind of identify. Uh, similarly, another member of that team will probably be West Virginia. Same reason. So I think that the opportunities and solutions are far broader than the two coasts, you know, respectfully. And um, that's where we need to work. Thank you. Great questions. Uh, we have a couple from the audience. Before that, I have one more for you, uh, Nader. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you talked all about um, kind of the... the uh, the polished really powerhouse that you've built there. And, and I just wondering if you could comment a little bit more about all the steps that it takes to get this phase one to phase zero to try. So you talk about 
the precision medicine ability on the on the first day of biopsy, and then the ability to do the testing after the surgery to do the PDA key. So those are all CLIA certified tests that you guys have have kind of optimized within uh, the Barrow and have been able to get turnarounds within 24 to 48 hours. And then right. you're choosing the selective kind of targets that so that the known tests that you guys could do could turn around those so quickly in order to make these critical decisions within short times, both pre-op and then post-op. Is that, I don't know if you want to comment a little bit about that. Yeah, I think my comment is you're absolutely right. It's complicated. It's not easy. Um, I don't think you look at it in terms of where we are today. You look at it in terms of how we started. I mean, today, you know, there are about 50 to 60 full-time employees in the Ivy Center, basic science and clinical trials side. You know, we have about $130 million in extramural funding. Um, but six years ago, when we started, none of that existed. It was really me trying to do a single phase zero. I found resources, not just in our institute, but at our other centers, like Carmanos Cancer Institute, which is a well-known early phase uh, center and medical center and cancer center in Detroit that has nothing to do with brain tumors, but I use some of their you know, expertise and carried it over to brain tumors. Uh, TGen, which is the biotech. So, you know, I would say you start with one effort, you find the pieces you need to put in place, and then you find partners and collaborators to do that. As you become familiar with the science and the trials and tribulations, like you alluded to, how do you create a CAPCLIA certified PK and PD core in an academic medical center? You know, you can get to that step, but it's kind of brick by brick. So, um, I don't think any of it is with is beyond the reach of any center, quite honestly. A couple of questions from the audience, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Mustafa Fatihi asks, uh, "What is the role for serial CSF sampling as a surrogate or complement uh, for tissue sampling after drug administration? Have you looked at that?" Yeah, I think what we can comment about CSF is that it's not an effective surrogate for brain penetration, and unfortunately, you know, it would be great if it were. But when we measure drug levels in brain tumor tissue, it has very little to do with drug levels in CSF. So that alone tells you that it's limited in value. Now, I think if you're trying to treat leptomeningeal disease, it's a different story. But when you're trying to get things into the parenchyma, the CSF doesn't give you the whole story in terms of drug levels. And obviously, we know there's a lot of exciting stuff in CSF with respect to, you know, free DNA levels and things like that. But, but those biomarker type liquid biopsy efforts, those are all still investigational right now. So you can't really hang your hat on them in a trial setting. And one last question from the audience, Alan Baranov asks, um, he wants to know about uh, animal models, GL261, is that a good animal model? Why is it, why are the cells not infiltrating the brain like you see in the human? And I would just add to that, you know, what is the role of, of animal models for GBM in the future? Uh, do you think there's any role at all? Well, we have a pretty robust animal modeling effort within our center, but we use it really as a very basic kind of filtering mechanism for new drugs. So at any given point, we probably have about a dozen new class, new in class drugs at the preclinical level being vetted by our people. And we put them into patient derived xenograph models. GL261 obviously is a commonly used animal model, but like many other similar animal models, it suffers from the kind of the artifactualness of, of these immortalized lines. So patient-derived xenografts, I think, are probably the best thing we have available, but still extremely limited. Obviously, the immune system is not in play. So we use it to answer basically three basic questions for any new therapy. One, can we measure enough drug in the animal model to convince us the drug can get in? Two, is the drug modulating its target in the animal model? And three, is there some sort of, you know, rudimentary survival benefit in this animal model with the drug? If the answer to those questions are yes, from that point, that's kind of enough for us. Everything else needs to be answered in the patient. Great. Well, well thank you again. Uh, that was really a phenomenal talk. I think, uh, we, we definitely believe in, in what you guys are doing out there. We actually have two grants pending on, on window of opportunity trials as well here, and we hope to get those up and running as well because we, we do agree that that's the way of the future. So congratulations again on everything, and, and thanks for your time. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Talk to you soon.